We're Colin Kirsty from the west of Scotland and we love adventuring and travelling around the UK but predominantly our beloved homeland of Scotland. We hike trails, cycle, canoe, kayak and wild camp in some of the most spectacular areas of outstanding beauty Scotland has to offer. So come join us on our next journey of exploration. Morning folks, well as you can slightly make out from the, the video it's the start of the week and there's forecast to be a huge dusting off snow, we'll call it a storm, the fact that it's actually only two millimetres thick, well it just inspired me to not go to work the next couple of days and instead pack my gear and choose somewhere to head off on an adventure for a wee solo camping overnight with a couple of days of hiking. Unfortunately, I've dug out these two walking Perthshire and Highland Perthshire walks and I can't see the walk in it, so my only thing I can think that I did was I must have went online to, there's a site called Walk Highlands and uh, I must have got the walk from there and then printed off some maps and memory map so, hello Archie Barra, I've, call, I've called him my old dog, oops <laughs> Lucky Curfew wasn't here, she wouldn't be too happy You want a coffee? Anyway, so I'm going to check that online and then my plan is to show you how I get ready for a trip, get my gear together, what I'm going to take and then we'll head off tomorrow and hope the passes are clear and we're able to get up to Pitlockery. Cheers. So usually when I'm planning a trip away, the first thing I do is decide what kind of trip it's going to be, whether I'm going to hike, whether I'm going to be camping overnight, whether I'm cycling and camping, canoeing, kayaking. Too many choices sometimes, but usually the the first protocol is a lot of the time I've been doing this for many years now is I just hit the memory bank and I think of any good walks or trails that I've done, took note of little sections of those trails and know that I can kind of safely, because it's winter time, I can safely head out there, find a decent camping spot and be safe there and still make it back after a day. So if I'm looking for some new ideas, I've got a lot of books, you can see there, if I pan across, there's kind of lots and lots of books, all in bushcraft, canoeing, kayak and numerous trails and a lot of these books have got ideas of where I'm going to sort of hike, you know, within sort of a couple hours driving distance usually, although I do have national ones for me and Kirsty do the trails in the summertime. The next stage after that is the, the tough section. Back when I had my own house uh, over, I stayed at Loch Lomond side at Balloch, I'd built myself a purpose-built man cave, so to speak. Uh, it was insulated, had lights, heating, I could dry all my tents in there and it was very easy access so I just basically walked in and I had racking for all my sleeping bags and rucksacks and maps and bushcraft gear and all my cookware so it was very easy to put my stuff together and put it away and dry it very easy. Unfortunately like the, the sheds we've got when I moved in with Kirsty they're full of our bikes and things like that so the only option I had was to convert Kirsty's loft, so it was full of pipes and I must have spent about five days doing it, putting stilts in all the floor joists and then flooring it out and then building little racks everywhere so I could put my sleeping bags and all my kit. Can I got a lot rid of a lot of kit as well because I was just I was just obsessed with having tents and like the next best thing, ultralight gear and everything like that. So 
I'll give you a little show around where I keep all my stuff and how difficult it is to get in and out, you know, because it's at the top of a stairwell. I've built a hatch into the side of the loft space and I've got to jump through there, get all the stuff, fitted a big strip light, but still kind of quite dark. So apologies if the light's not great. I'll show you where I keep all my stuff and what I can do to pack everything, okay? So this is the deep dark hole. Every time I'm going away into one of my adventures that I have to clamber in, but you can see I've, from the height of it, I've put stilts all over the loft, put lighting and electricity, carpeted it out, built lots of racks, so I can at least go into the loft space and put my stuff away after the trip and easily find it. Now sometimes you can't be bored and the temptation is you just fling it in the door and that's it until next time. So we'll take you in and show you my setup. So you can see it's pretty full. Every corner is basically got stuff in it. So I tend to try and keep some of the heavier stuff close by. So down here to this side, I've got some of my kitchen stuff. So I can easily get my cook stuff, my meths, my pots, my easier stuff. There's my cycling panniers. I usually have a supply of the bag meals if I, I decide to do that, but a lot of the time I'll just buy stuff in the, the shops, you know. Yeah, I tend to keep all my tripods and the heavier things like the Dutch oven close to the door. Then over here, I've got all my tents and sleep mats and bivy bags and tarps and to tell you the truth I've got that much stuff sometimes I forget and then at the back there's the the teepee and the big titanium stove canoe barrels gloves then I've got a couple of racks just for keeping all my odds and ends all kind of repair kit water filters crampons lanterns and then Kind of every single corner's got something in it. Seats, you can see I've I've got more backpacks than I, I know what to do. I got rid of a lot of them recently. Uh, I tend to kind of I was ultra light, so I had the MLD bag, but I've kind of went for something a bit more sturdy, but still lightweight now. You can see all my axes hanging up and more backpacks and want more backpacks and panniers there. And then what I've done was, this is the water tank down here, and you can see I basically created a do-it-yourself, sort of kill-yourself rack to get up to, and steps to get up to my sleeping bags and things. So I've racked up here, I've got, I think I've got a couple of sleeping bags in there. And if I take you up here, without killing myself, you can see this is the area above our bedroom we sleep in. And I keep a lot of my sleeping bags and bivy bags and bed rolls and everything up there. And again, I've racked up here. See my dehydrator. Sometimes I do the dehydrate my own food and make that. More kitchen wear over there. Beds, seats, telescopes. Stuff I forget I've even got. But it's a bit of a, a flaff to get all your gear to go but you've just got to be focused and think about the enjoyment you're going to have and the, the worst thing you can do sometimes is you come back you're tired and everyone's wet and the temptation is just to open that door and fling it all into the loft but the minute you do that it just becomes 10 times worse because you then can't find anything for your next trip so you just scramble around rushing put the stuff in the backpack, come back, fling it in again because everything's a mess and you've got to climb over it. So it's always worth drying your kit off because it lasts longer and putting it away somewhere you can find it. So I'm going to head downstairs now, go online and see if I can plot out the route. On my phone and on the computer I've got a fantastic, hold on, I'm trying not to kill myself, I've got a fantastic app called Memory Map. Years ago I used to have it on the CD-ROM 
and I could print off maps on the computer rather than buying OS maps. It was very expensive. But nowadays you've got it on your phone and your laptop. And what's good about it, it shows you your current location. And I've had it for about four years on the phone now. And I don't think it's ever failed. You know, you talk about having signals and it obviously works off GPS and whatever else. And the, the good thing is you can... As long as the night before you're where you're going to walk, if you just have a look at it on the phone, it downloads that whole section for you. And it means if you do go into an area where the satellite can't sort of reach you, you've still got the maps there. And a lot of the times, I say 99% of the time, the minute you put that on your app, you just press a little button on the app and a little red circle comes up and shows you where you are on that map and where you're walking. So... Idiots like me don't get killed so easily. Uh, it's You've still got to obviously know how to map read and check things out, but it's a good wee app to kind of let you explore. It lets you see features, historical things, cairns and standing stones and castles in the area and lets you kind of head off in that direction if you want a good wee support. Uh, a wee explore even. I'm out of breath getting up into this loft. So I'm going to head down, go on the computer, check the map out, check Walk Highlands and print off the route I'm going to do tomorrow and we'll see you when we head off. Hi folks, well we finally reached uh, Pit Lockery and set off on a solo camp, overnight camp. Uh, before I left I knew <clears throat> there was a danger of a kind of amber weather warning. I think it's only the third time in fourth year, uh, four years that they've predicted snowfall, but I knew it wasn't due until tomorrow morning so I thought my problem will be <laughs> getting back home rather than anything. But as I was driving up, the van temperature had it as minus 10. And now that I'm in Pit Lockery, I'm minus 7. So it's going to be a cold one tonight. But it's a glorious day. It's, it's one of those perfect days for walking. When you first set off and you put the, the backpack on, oh, it's a cold. I want to put all my layers on just now. But in typical fashion in all hikes around the world, it always starts off with a huge hill and within about five minutes off it's the opposite you're kind of thinking i oh, will strip some layers off so you can see we're we're basically just leaving the town just now and behind me it kind of i think if you can see it there it looks as if it's just a big kind of play area or a field but that's actually a big giant pond and it's just frozen over it's that cold because you're kind of high up in Aberfoyle so uh going to leave here and we cut off in a minute just up by a golf course and we'll just go over there. I don't think anybody will be playing golf today unless they've got yellow balls and a big warm pair of gloves. So we'll get there and then after that we're on to forestry track for maybe about four or five miles so I should be able to see the, the path okay. Shouldn't be a problem once I get up there as long as I can find it. I always think the hardest part of any hike is the start. <laughs> the amount of times I've climbed mountains or trails and it's actually hard to find the start of it sometimes. It doesn't bode well for the rest of the walk. But once we walk on further on, we'll cross over the River Tummel at Killer Cranky where the battle site was. And then we'll get a beautiful walk after that. It's, just follows the river downstream, it's all woodland and waterfalls and it's really stunning. But hopefully I'll find somewhere 
to camp up. I've brought a slightly bigger tent this time, just because of the conditions, it's going to be so cold. But I'll, I'll let you go just now because I've taken my gloves off and my hands are freezing within about two seconds, it's that cold. But absolutely stunning, eh? It'll just be the start of it. We'll catch you soon. Somebody was a bit of a clown. <laughs> I stopped further down the, the hill to take the drone out and put it up and I was that excited about how lovely it looked and the like, snow's all, don't know if you can see it, it's all glistening. But I took my gloves off, dug the drone out, up I walked up the hill and everything and I'm congratulating myself and how beautiful this must look on camera. I get all the way up to the top of the hill, just about to go in to the forestry path and I'm thinking, oh my hands are getting a little bit cold here. Yep, took my gloves off and left them away down the hill. So, 10 minutes back down the hill. Hopefully Santa Claus hasn't decided to swing by and steal my gloves. <laughs> they'll still be there but lesson learned how easy it is you know if it's the sun's out and it's as glorious as this and you take your gloves off when it's minus six but you know that way you're walking you soon warm up i'm just kind of not feeling it just now so that would have been a bit of a shock later on this evening that would have been a bit of a mistake so hopefully i can find where i put them on a wall but meantime, how stunning is this, eh? Absolutely beautiful. To be honest with you, I'd be quite happy just marching up and down this hill. It's a different matter and a misty sort of day that's freezing cold and it's all wet and miserable and stuff, you know? But... Here we are, the evidence <laughs> of how much of a clown I am. One pair of gloves. <laughs> oh well, back up the hill again. Lesson learned. We'll see you up further on the walk. I am officially the happiest wee boy in the world. I did this walk about 10 years ago and I've always had in my head the second half of the, the walk is what it's about. It's absolutely stunning. But isn't it amazing when you can get one of those crisp, clear Scottish days that happen once every 300 years and there's been snow on the ground but the sun's out and even though it's minus six, you're hiking, you're not feeling it, so obviously you're starting to get warm. But this section, I've always seen as a bit of a, a boring bit, you know, it's forestry roads and tracks for the next, like, four miles till you get up to Killacranky. But with the dust and the snow and the clear sky, it's absolutely stunning. And I'm so glad I came. I was doubtful whether to come up because of the forecast heavy snow but who cares if I get stuck you know not with scenes like this to walk through absolutely magical no wonder they call it God's country 
But God's country has led me to a section that is going uphill. It's clearly been a mud bath before and a bit of a river. So as you can see, I think I'll uh, turn the camera off and concentrate or stick my Yeti grips on so I don't slip. But absolutely stunning. Apologies if the, the sound's not great, it's just the onboard mic. I couldn't be bothered bringing the microphone out and setting it up to take a little bit of footage. But we'll speak to you a bit further on. Can't get enough of this walking, but see sometimes your own stupidity. I was that happy with the beautiful surroundings. I was just walking on, I thought, oh, do a nice time lapse while walking with it. And I was that busy concentrating that. I know the walk through the forest walks on for so many miles, then it, it cuts down back to the A9 road and you go under it and then along the side of the forest to Killacranky and I was that busy concentrating my time lapse I came to the first junction after a couple of miles and I just presumed it was downhill and I didn't stop to, to check and I walked all the way down another about half mile, three quarters of a mile towards the road I came to a junction and I was like Oh, I don't remember this junction. So I checked my memory map and it's, I seem to be going the wrong direction. <laughs> I kind of, it puzzles you for a second or two and then you realise you're being a tube. And of course, if you take the wrong direction, you never get to go downhill. You have to climb another half mile back uphill to get right, the right track. So, lesson learned. And I'm sure it'll never happen again for at least half an hour which just shows you should always check your your map and if there's no signs especially in winter it's important it's been a beautiful day like this but it's so important that you actually stop and take stock so many people have been recording history are getting lost and the uh, fundamental mistake they make is that they, they think they'll push on, you know, they don't actually, there's something in the human psyche, I believe anyway, that tells you to go forward and not back, and I think that's when so many people make the mistake and get themselves really into trouble, because you can, your mind can play tricks on you, and I think you can see what you want to see, and especially when you've got maps with you and things, it's just making sure you take the time to have a look at it and double check every so often you're on the right route whether it's your map and compass or kind of memory map or one of these things an OS map but never mind we're back on track and this forest track is absolutely beautiful it's nice powdered snow I thought I'd have to put my yetis on my boots stop myself slipping but it's that lovely powdery snow absolutely great to walk in and again apologies of the the sound it's the first time on the action cam the DJI that I've used on board mic so it's not that windy so hopefully the sound quality is not too bad oh these hills they'll be the death of me <laughs> But I love it. So we've came down out the high country and all the snow and came right down to where the A9 is and what you do is you cross under it, believe it or not, you just come right under the road. You can see here as far as I, I can see all the way down and all the way back up, you're just walking beside the stanchions and then you'll come down and the path will join onto the old military road, General Wade's road 
and take you into the village of Kilikanki. Well, that's me reached the Pass of Kilikranke, and I'm at the Kilikranke Visitor Centre. I'm about to head down to to visit a, an area over a river called Soldier's Leap. That's got quite a good story. I'll tell you in a shortly. But behind me is a Jacobite cafe, and I think we're a cold day, and the temps are going to plummet later on. I'll go in and maybe see if I can get myself a wee takeaway soup or something. Seems like a good idea to me. So I've I found the visitor centre and it's uh, it's nice and cold. <laughs> so I've got myself a nice tomato and basil soup and I'm gonna sit here and enjoy a bit of warmth in me and just watching the the birds just uh, the bird feeder there. So we've walked about 10 minutes down from the Killacranky Visitor Centre to visit an area by the River Gary known as Soldier's Leap and it's famous after the Battle of Killacranky in 1689 one of the red coat English soldiers was fleeing his Jacobite pursuers when he reached this point down by the river and rather than be captured legend is that he jumped five and a half metres from the big giant rock over to the other side rather than be captured and killed by the Jacobite Highlander soldiers. This is it here of a, a clear it. There we go. You can see it there. And that's the the area down there. I'll try and zoom in. That's the big giant snow covered rock they leapt across to the other side. With us leaving Soldiers Leap, I think that will be a good time for us to wrap up this week's video. Be sure and join us for part two of the solo hike camp in the Pass of Killicranky. Many thanks for watching.